The views and opinions expressed in the following program are not necessarily those of Open Sky Radio. Please be advised. Good day, everybody. Welcome to the Fire You Can't Put Out with you as usual. My name is Melvin, and I want to thank you for joining me for episode 46 of this almost one-year-old program. Now, can you believe it? Uh, I, I met Tom Hartman a couple of weeks ago. He was in town doing a book signing for his uh, book that is out now called The Crash of 2016. Now, with a title like that, it made me think, you know... When a when your book is out in a few years, if there's no crash, you're going to be pretty red in the face. Uh, I I bought a copy of the book. I got my picture taken with him, got it autographed, and all the rest. And I have I've yet to dig into it yet. But I found a story in Mother Jones this week that qualifies quite a bit of what Tom has been saying about the upcoming crash. Follow me here. When we had the crash which began in 2007, but didn't fully take place in 2008, it it began like this. Um, after World War II, we went without a banking or economic crash for about 40 plus years, almost 50 years. Then when Ronald Reagan became president, he deregulated the savings and loans. Within a couple of years, we had a savings and loan crash. In 1999, a bill went before Congress called Graham Leach Bliley. And what that bill did was it killed an earlier bill called Glass Steagall. After the Great Depression, there was a bill that was that was passed through Congress called Glass Steagall, and it was as simple as this. It said that you are either a traditional bank a boring old bank, you take in money, you send out money, and that's it. Or you're an investment bank. And if you're an investment bank, then people have to know that ahead of time. That way they know if they're putting their money with you, they're taking a risk. And then we went without a crash for a very long time. With the great, with what happened during the Great Depression, people really didn't want to go through that again. That really wasn't comfortable for essentially anybody. So began the slow deregulation after the Reagan presidency. And in 1999, when Graham Leach Bliley, forgive me, I always stutter when I say that, passed and it killed Glass-Steagall, a Congress member went to the floor and said, within 10 years, we are going to have a crash. And everybody laughed at him. What was created after Glass-Steagall was killed was what was called a derivative or a securitized investment. And the investments that were created were mortgaged-backed securities. So the idea there was to t- was to get as many people as possible into mortgages and bundle those mortgages and sell them as securities to investors worldwide. I've mentioned this before. The GDP for the entire planet is about $65 trillion. By the, by the time the economy crashed, over $800 trillion, more than the entire GDP of the entire world, more than $800 trillion in these mortgage-backed securities had been sold. And then in 2008, they all came crumbling down. Recently, a report came out that said, well, after the crash, the economy obviously has been, has been doing better. But in my opinion, we're really just inflating another bubble. And with derivatives, our Congress never made derivatives illegal again. And there have now been $700 trillion of them sold. So what does that mean? Another hundred trillion dollars, if eight hundred trillion is the threshold to crash the economy. But think about this: if the entire GDP is sixty-five trillion, quite honestly, it should have been crashed by now. Why hasn't it crashed? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Uh, the Fed is artificially holding down interest rates, okay, and that's and and so that's 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 helping the economy a little bit. Um, 
those those securities are still being sold. But this time they're being backed by renters. Follow me here. This comes from Mother Jones. Over the last year and a half, Wall Street hedge funds and private equity firms have quietly amassed an unprecedented rental empire. In total, these deep-pocketed investors have bought more than 200,000 cheap, mostly foreclosed homes in cities hardest hit. Wall Street's foreclosure crisis, which began in late 2007, forced more than 10 million people from their homes. Millions evicted needed a new place to go. So Wall Street devised a solution. They began buying up all of those houses. Since the buying frenzy began, the Blackstone Group, the largest private equity firm in the world, has been buying up houses at foreclosure auctions, through local brokers, and in bulk purchases directly from the banks. In one move, in one move, they bought 1,400 houses in Atlanta in a single day. As of November, Blackstone had spent $7.5 billion on 40,000 mostly foreclosed homes across the country. That's a spending rate of $100 million a week since October 2012. It recently announced plans to take business international beginning in the foreclosure-ravaged Spain. Blackstone is a publicly owned company with a list of institutional owners that reads exactly like, well, the guys that crashed the economy the first time, J.P. Morgan, Citigroup, Deutsche Bank, UBS, Bank of America, Goldman Sachs, and of course, J.P. Morgan Chase. Last year, Mark Alston, a real estate broker in Los Angeles, began noticing something strange happening. Home prices were rising, and they were rising fast, up 20% between October 2012, the same month last year. In a normal market, rising home prices would mean increased demand from home buyers. But there was an unnerving thing. The home ownership rate was dropping. From 2009 to 2012, the top 1% of Americans have captured 95% of all income gains. So what are they doing with all of those homes? It's Wall Street. These are Wall Street banks that are buying these homes. So what are they doing with these homes? Are they moving into these homes? Absolutely not. The security... The securitized investments that were sold around the world originally backed by mortgages, they're now being backed by these rentals. In November, after many months of high, Blackstone released history's first rated bond backed by securitized rental payments. And once investigators tripped over themselves in a rush to get it, Blackstone's competitors announced that they too would develop those same securities as soon as possible. There's one significant way, however, in which this kind of security offers or differs from its mortgage-backed counterpart. When banks repossess mortgage homes as collateral, there is at least the assumption that the homeowner has indeed defaulted on their mortgage. In this case, if a single home rental bond blows up, thousands of families will be evicted from their homes without even missing a single rental payment. So they're now taking all of these rental homes, bundling them, selling them on the world market, and when those collapse, and they will collapse, all of those people are going to be thrown out onto the streets even if they haven't missed any of their rental payments. This is the second crash. So they're landlords now essentially, right? So they're t uh, obviously they're taking care of the people that live in those places. Absolutely not. When houses have structural or infestation problems, residents like Kadana Porter are ignored. After repeatedly filing online maintenance requests that were canceled without anyone coming to her house to investigate the infestation, she called the company repair hotline and nobody answered. We're allowing Wall Street to control a significant sector of single-family housing, said Michael Donnelly, a resident of Chicago, who has been investigating Blackstone's rapidly expanding presence in the neighborhood. But is it sustainable, he wondered. It could all collapse in 2016, and we will be worse off than we were in 2016. And it has already been set into motion. What's happening right now is not a real economy. Houses are being bought up, yeah, but they're not being bought up by people like you and I. Wall Street is buying them, and they're not living inside of them, and they're selling them on the world market. Can anything stop the collapse of 2016? 
It'll be interesting to see. If the crash does happen, and it almost certainly looks like it will, I think finally there will be major change that will be brought about. After the collapse of 2008, George W. Bush and the Republicans could not comfort the big banks fast enough. I remember George W. Bush going before the American people with hat in hand, trembling, saying that we want to put $700 billion of American taxpayer dollars at risk. No questions asked. It was like a one or two page bill. I think after the collapse this time, the pressure might finally be enough to change the rules, to get rid of derivatives, and make these mortgage-backed securities illegal. Wall Street and the banks, as they've always done, just crashing the economy again. All of the bills that went in front of Congress after Barack Obama became president were all filibustered by the Republicans. Absolutely not. They're not having any of it. And when the crash happens in or near 2016, they're going to turn right to the president and go, it's his fault. My hope is that Obama and Congress does not bail out the banks this time. If free market, as the conservatives like to say it is, is really the free market, sink or swim according to your ability, then I hope all these banks sink. There really shouldn't be this many crashes. We should not have a boom and bust economy. I want to get into uh, the the other side of this. So those are generally your conservatives on the Wall Street bank side of the aisle. And I want to get to the rolling jubilee, uh, the Wall, Wall, uh, Wall Street uh, activists, the Occupy Wall Street activists. For a year and a half, 80-year-old Kentucky resident Shirley Longsden received, received repeated calls from a debt collision, uh, a collection agency over an unpaid medical bill. Then one day out of the blue, she received a letter saying the $983 debt had been handled purchased by Rolling Jubilee, a group linked to the Occupy Wall Street movement. The group is an outfit la- that was launched about a year ago by former Occupy Wall Street members, now grouped under the Nationwide Strike Debt Collective. You can find more information at rollingjubilee.org. The idea? Buy up the personal debt of those who are struggling to fulfill their basic needs like health care and housing. Uh, they have bought up $13.5 million in medical debt for only $400,000. How have they done that? In the United States, when a bill is not paid within 90 days, a bank can attempt to reduce its losses by selling the loan at an undisclosed price to professional debt buyers. These are then resold on a secondary market. Banks sell debt for pennies on the dollar on a shadowy speculative market of debt buyers who then turn around and try to collect the full amount from debtors. According to Strike Debt member Ann Larson, for every dollar of debt we abolish, we paid only two cents. Medical bills are one of the leading cause of personal bankruptcies in the United States. So what is next for them? Well, there's over a trillion dollars in student debt. So that is what they'll be taking up next. So you've got Wall Street bankers fleecing the country, and then you've got Occupy Wall Street actually helping people, saving them from medical debt, and next, saving them from college debt, a $1 trillion debt. American college students have a $1 trillion debt now. That, that is another bomb that will, unfortunately, have to explode. It's the commons. Education is an investment in America, and I believe that college, at least through your state, your state or local municipality, that college should cost nothing. If you want to go to a private $100,000 a year college, then that is entirely up to you. Let's get into Obamacare and what a difference a week makes. So, um, 29, excuse me, 26,794 private plans in October. Uh, in additional, t- in addition to the 79,391 who signed up through state runs exchanges in 14 different states. So the numbers, the numbers were, were pretty bleak. So let's get to November. It looks like signups were around 100,000 through the federal exchange, nearly four times the numbers reported in October. November 30th was the date that the administration set for themselves to fix the majority of the problems on the website, and it seems like most of those are under control. But bottom line, healthcare.gov on December 1st is 
night and day compared to October 1st. While there are still some issues, the website works 90% of the time. System response time has fallen from 8 seconds to less than 1 second, and the website can now hold up to 50,000 users at a time. But wait, it gets, it gets even better. On, so today is the, today is the fourth, so yesterday was the third. Uh, consumer reports, uh, encourage people to start using the, the ACA website. Uh, consumer reports was formerly, uh, opposed saying, it's not very good. Uh, don't even bother with it. But now they're, they're giving it the thumbs up. Consumer Reports, the nonpartisan Consumer Reports are saying, hey, go on and go. Uh, I love Consumer Reports. They have also been debunking the, the Obamacare uh, horror stories. Nancy Metcalf told Chuck Todd on MSNBC on Tuesday, it's terrific. I've tried it. It was working yesterday, even during the busiest times. Do you hear that? That's the sound of conservative talking points dying. And Obama, Obama has said that he is going to go ahead and sign up on the website. Merely symbolic. Uh, let's see. Uh, President Obama will sign up for health insurance through the ACA uh, exchange. Uh, Press Secretary Jay Carney said this past Monday. I don't have an update for you on that. I know that he will and has said that he will. Carney told reporters. Soon after the ACA passed, the White House told USA Today that Obama would sign up for insurance through an exchange, and when Political followed up this year, a reporter was directed back to those comments. Carney's comments Monday were the first recent confirmation of the president's plans. He has the option of choosing to work through the District of Columbia or his state of Illinois. As Politico has noted, and that's where the story is coming from, the president's decision would be a symbolic one since he and the first family rely on the White House doctors for medical care. It would also come at a substantial out-of-pocket cost because it would not be taxpayer subsidized. One of the things, uh, one of the favorite memes I heard on the right after this, after this happened was, it's in the bill that Obama doesn't have to sign up for Obamacare. And what do you know? He went ahead and he's going to sign up for Obamacare. I know it's, it's, it's symbolic, but hey, it's something. So the Koch brothers are at it. And as I've said before, the Koch brothers don't want young people to sign up for health care. Why do they care? Well, for, it's, they want, they want it to fail. The, the Obamacare model only works if young people sign up. If nothing but older, sicker people sign up, yeah, that could tank it. So young people need to sign up. So the Koch brothers, who are oil billionaires, have been throwing parties at colleges called Generation Opportunity. Okay. Now, you may remember Generation Opportunity. They made those over-the-top advertisements where it showed Uncle Sam with a speculum uh, in your gynecologist office um, about to inspect a woman. Oh, boy. So they took their opposition to health care reform to a whole new level uh, on Saturday a couple of weeks ago, and they threw a tailgate party. During the University of Miami, Miami, Virginia Tech football game that featured flashy cars, drinking games, models, a DJ, and plenty of educational material about why young people shouldn't take advantage of Obamacare. Quote, we rolled in with a fleet of Hummers, F-150s, and Suburban, each vehicle equipped with an 8-foot-high balloon bouquet floating overhead. We hired a popular DJ from my from Miami, uh, DJ Joey, set up opt-out cornhole sets, beer bong tables, bought 75 pizzas, and hired eight brand ambassadors, o- a.k.a. models with bullhorns, to help out, wrote David Pass, Generation Opportunities Communication Director, in an email to the Tampa Bay Times. Student activists independently brought lots of beer and liquor on their own, they're saying, for those 21 and over. Uh, oh yeah, and we educated students about their health care options outside the expensive and creepy Obamacare exchanges. This won't be the last time Generation Opportunity throws this kind of event either. The group is planning on touring 20 different campuses. So why do a couple of oil billionaires care about whether or not young people sign up? Well, they want it to collapse. They want Obamacare to collapse. And why do they want Obamacare to collapse? Because if you keep the working class impoverished, they will remain politically impotent. And if they are politically impotent, they're not going to be out there watching what the Koch brothers are doing.
And the big thing that the Cokes want built right now is the Keystone XL pipeline because it will more than double. It will more than double their value. The Coke brothers, the Coke Industries. Think about how many congressmen you can buy with that. Uh, on the same subject, I mentioned Tappy last week, and I wasn't sure how many people had actually heard of that. That's the Tappy gas pipeline, um, which will run through four countries, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India. Uh, they finalized an agreement with the Asian Development Bank, which will act as transaction advisor to help generate over $7.5 billion for for finances, U.S.-based Chevron and ExxonMobil have expressed interest in financing and running the pipeline project, and uh, a consortium of financiers will be set up that will be led by one of those two companies. According to sources, the Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Resources will now seek approval from the Economic Coordination Committee in its upcoming meeting to pave the way for formally signing an agreement with the ADB and selecting a consortium leader to arrange financing for the pipeline. The ADB has already cautioned that it may exceed $10 billion because of the delay in the pipeline. This pipeline was supposed to begin a long time ago. So what's the problem? Well, war-wracked Afghanistan has already, issue, uh, has already assured Pakistan and other participating countries that tribal lords will ensure the security of the pipeline. Both Chevron and ExxonMobil, renowned oil and gas companies with vast energy in, in the experience sector, are keen to work as the consortium leaders. So, Afghanistan. One of those countries that's going to run through is Afghanistan. And I wanted to bring this to you. Uh, this comes from the Express Tribune. And the reason that this is important is because there is talk right now about keeping our troops in Afghanistan for another 10 years, even though there's really no benefit to the rest of us, to people like you or I. This is what America will be doing. And it will be subsidized by us. We're not going to benefit from that gas pipeline. We may get the energy that comes out of it, but it's not going to come to us at a discount. So it's going to be subsidized through you and I sending our loved ones over there to protect that, that, that pipeline. That will bring the grand total of years that we have been in Afghanistan, which by the way is already the longest war ever to over 20 years that we've been in that country for oil and gas and it really doesn't make it really doesn't make a lot of sense if these energies are so great and these energies are so profitable i think that these guys should have to pay for these things themselves but so it goes and most of our congress is owned by these oil and gas billionaires which is probably why they're at a 6% approval rating that's rock bottom. For the first time, America now has a higher opinion of car salespeople. This comes to us from the Washington Examiner. A new economic uh, economist, YouGov.com poll, put the approval rating of Congress at a historic low of 6%. The nation's bad opinion of Congress, impacted by inaction, budget fights, and the battle over the filibuster, has spread to Senate leaders. Just 19% approve of Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell, while 54% disapprove. Uh, Harry Reid's not immune from this either. Uh, his ratings are 52% unfavorable and 25% favorable. So just favorable by a little bit more. 72% of people disapprove of Congress. But we've got an election next year, and we can change all of that, right? Well, a couple of states are trying to say no. Uh, North Carolina and Ohio. I want to start with Ohio. The Republicans are going to hold on to Congress no matter what it takes. They did a dry run in 2013, and we talked about this a few weeks ago, uh, with, with keeping people away from the polls. They still lost quite a few, quite a few seats, but they, they're pretty confident that next year they've got it. So what is Ohio doing? I want to start with Marsha Fudge, who has asked Attorney General Eric Holder, who is, of course, Obama's Attorney General, to review two voting measures making their way through the state legislature that she claims would suppress the voting rights of African Americans and other minorities. Remember, African Americans in a really high numbers disproportionately vote for Democrats. So – they want to keep African Americans away from the polls. If you're looking for one group 
that overwhelmingly votes for Democrats. That would be African Americans. So let's keep the African Americans away from the polls. The two bills, uh, S38 and HB269, would reduce the number of absentee voting days by six, preventing newly registered voters from voting the day they register, and require voters to prevent valid identification, a driver's license, a state and military ID card, or a passport when casting a ballot, things that you have never had to do before. In her letter... Fudge charges that the legislation violates Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, which prohibits any voting qualification or practice applied by the state which results in the denial or abridgment of the right to vote based on race. Recent estimates indicate that over 900,000 eligible voters in Ohio lack the necessary ID, including as many as one in four eligible African Americans, the letter says. Same-day registration and voting have recently been at a higher rate by African Americans and lower income voters. Lower income voters, another group that votes for Democrats. With no identification that, or no indication that voter fraud is a widespread problem in Ohio, the proposal is a thinly veiled attempt to keep African Americans away from the polls. On Saturday, the Cleveland Plain Dealers editorial board came out against the limitation, writing that absent compelling evidence of election fraud, there is no good pro-voter reason to end the practice. It also condemned a separate measure that would change absentee ballot rules. But hold on, there's more. On to North Carolina. They're just compacting the calendar. They're not trying to keep women or African Americans away from the polls. They're just compacting the calendar. Okay, uh, Republican officials in North Carolina, which approved the most sweeping voter suppression law in the nation earlier this year, uh, Governor Pat McCrory, who spearheaded the fight, put a fascinating twist on his record this uh, uh, earlier this week during an interview with MSNBC's Chuck Todd. After dismissing criticisms of a new voter ID law, he described the policy as common sense despite the fact that it undermines voting and solves a problem that doesn't exist. The Republican governor bristled in response to a question about early voting. He says, we didn't shorten early voting, we compacted the calendar. Starting next year, McCrory's voter suppression law reduces the early voting period from 17 days to 10 days. What's more... The same law McCrory is so eager to defend also places new restrictions on voter registration drives and makes it harder for students to vote. Ends same day, same day registration. Uh, makes it easier for vigilante poll watchers to tell people, no, I'm sorry, but you can't vote. Here's the thing. They're saying that these laws are necessary to keep the vote honest. I don't know if anyone remembers the HAVA Act, Help America Vote Act, which was George W. Bush's idea passed by a Republican Congress and what that did after the 2000 election, which came, well, first of all, insanely close. And that was eventually decided by the Supreme Court. Of course, we found out a year later that Gore had actually won Florida, which would have given him the presidency. It doesn't matter. After that happened, after that election, uh, Bush says, I want to help America vote. And so here comes the HAVA Act. So what did the HAVA Act do? It privatized the vote. It turned it over to Diebel, private for-profit companies with machines that were easy to hack in order to flip elections. The gold standard for how an election is going to turn out has always been the exit polls. And after we began using more voting machines, all of a sudden the exit polls don't work. See, exit polls work every other place in the world. Most news organizations don't even ask about the exit polls anymore. Or if they do, they take them with a grain of salt. Because for some reason in America, they don't work anymore in places where there's electronic voting. If there were indeed a case, any case, even one case of voter fraud, let alone the widespread voter fraud that we are being told exists right now, if there was even one case of voter fraud, the name of that fraudster would be on the lips of every American in the country. It would be all over right-wing radio, whoever that person was. It would be on Fox News. It would be on the right-wing blogs and, and right-wing news sites. It would be all over the place. That person that committed voter fraud that would justify all of these new voter laws, that person, his or her name, that would be a household name. You hear that? Nothing. 
That's exactly what it is. There is no voter fraud. This is an absolutely naked attempt of a dying party to stop people from turning out because they know that if they can stop people from turning out wherever there's elections that have low turnouts, that's that's where the Republicans do well. Let's get to Michigan. Of course, Detroit recently filed for, for bankruptcy uh, after years and years of that city being gutted. And now, uh, thanks to a petition drive that resulted in 4.2% of Michiganders voicing their minority opinion, Mission is about to become a place where women have to plan ahead for their abortions. A controversial initiative that would require women to buy an additional rider on their health insurance if they would like abortion coverage is just one short step away from going to the legislature where it is likely to become law because no one filed a challenge by the deadline to the more than 315,000 signatures turned into the Secretary of State, an initiative that would prohibit abortion coverage from being included in standard issue or standard insurance policies will go forward. The State Board of Canvassers met at 9.30 on December 2nd to certify the signatures. If they pass it, it becomes law. And the other 95.8% won't even have a say. As it turns out, more Michigan voters actually oppose the law and support it. Do you understand what this is? Uh, uh, now, with abortion, obviously there's quite a few people who get abortions because they can't, they don't feel ready for a child, uh, either emotionally uh, or financially. And then, of course, there it is in the case of rape. So this is essentially, and so this would be a rider to your policy. This is something extra that you would have to buy. Um, nobody ever plans on an abortion. It's one of those things that happens and it's unfortunate. It, one of the harsh realities of life. But these groups, who by the way, um, freedom, 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 liberty, liberty, liberty. These groups now want you to buy what amounts to Rape insurance. I want to cover a couple of my DMs. Let's start with Jim Wheeler, a Republican state assemblyman from Nevada who recently spoke to the Las Vegas Sun. A question was asked to Wheeler about whether he would vote to bring back slavery if his constituents asked him to. Wheeler's response should have been no. So what was Wheeler's response? If that's what they wanted, this is a quote, if that's what they wanted, I'd have to hold my nose, I'd have to bite my tongue, and they'd probably have to hold a gun to my head. But yeah, if that's what the citizens of the, well, if that's what my constituency wants, uh, and they elected me, that's what they elected me for. That's what a republic is about. Wheeler's been in office since 2010. Uh, Republican Governor Sandoval uh, took the first steps to criticize Wheeler, stating that his recent comments were deeply offensive uh, and asked him to issue an, apolo uh, an apology. Uh, not all Tea Party members or conservative members are racist, but the unfortunate truth is that many racists are conservative Tea Party members. Should we bring back slavery? No. It really should have been. It really should have been that simple. So uh, they're not racist. We've we've established that already. Uh, so let's go to Louisiana. Meet Lyndall Tops, a LaForce Paris councilman who wants to defund libraries around this country to build a brand new prison. You heard that right. Uh, this comes to us from ClassWarfareExists.com. First explains Tops. Libraries are teaching Mexicans how to speak English. Tops told the local Tri Paris Times, uh, referencing. Biblioteca Hispana, a Spanish language section of one of the nine, uh, nine branch libraries, let that SOB go back to Mexico. Remember, he's not racist. There's just so many things that they're doing that I don't agree with. Them junkies and hippies and food stamp recipients and all, they use the library to look at drugs and food stamps on the internet. I've seen them do it. That's right. They're looking at drugs and food stamps on the internet. Or maybe they're using the internet to get food stamps. Why Topes finds a person immersing himself or herself in the native language is uh, offensive and, ba and baffling. And why would a junkie go to the library to look at drugs unless you can get a contact high from looking at pictures of weed? Topes thinks that libraries have been hoarding too much money. Big library, he calls them, has got its fingers in the taxpayer's wallet and has been robbing them of money 
that could go towards jails. They got too much money, Tope said. We're giving the public the chance to raise the jail money without raising taxes. Any blind man can see that. Library System Director Laura Sanders, who gave... Uh, this response to Topps' plans, she noted that for Topps, the issue of the jail's condition is a personal one because he does have family members that are incarcerated, she says. So, dig this. He says, okay, it's always big, right? Because we say big oil and big energy, right? And so he says, big library, right? And they say, big library and, and, and big labor, right? That's, 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 those are the enemies of the right. You can go on to whitehouse.gov slash calculator and you can look and you can plug in what you make per year into the White House website and then they will tell you where your tax dollars go, how much you pay in tax dollars generally. I mean, it's a, it's kind of a round number. Uh, and then they will tell you where they go. More than half of what we spend in this country goes to the Pentagon. More than half. Food stamps? are very, very little. It always bothers me when they go after food stamp recipients. I used to be one when I was a, a, a young man. Um, so all the money is being spent in the military, but that, that is sacred. You're not allowed to talk about that. It's It always bothers me, and I'll get into this a little bit more later, about the conversations that we have in this country, how much they are... Um, influenced or actually being drawn up by somebody else if there is truly a problem with the way that we spend money or our government spends money let's go to the most direct let me right to it where's all of our money going it's not going to food stamp recipients okay it's not going to roads and bridges it's not going to police and fire it's going to the pentagon and then that is going all over the world and it's really not doing us any good Yes, we need a military. Yes, we need a strong military. But we don't need to spend the kind of money that we're spending. Also, I disagree with the, the, the privatization of the military. So many jobs that we used to use soldiers for and pay soldiers a wage for, we are now paying these private contractors for. And we pay them about five or six times more than we pay our soldiers. You want to look for waste, fraud, and abuse? Look at the money that we are spending on defense. So the economy is doing wonderfully, depending on who you ask. You look around, it seems to be doing wonderfully. There was a gentleman a while ago who wanted to build a floating city for the wealthy. Uh, he wanted to call it the Freedom Ship. And after the economic crash happened, he put it on hold. But he recently said that it is a live project again. The guy's name is Roger Gooch and he told the Telegraph, Telegraph's Hannah Strange, the Freedom Ship will be the largest vessel ever built and the first ever floating city. The city will cost approximately $10 billion to construct, but Gooch believes that with the economy recovering, he can secure the funding. The ship will be 25 stories high, over one mile long, and will feature an airport to ferry passengers and residents on and off the boat. Because of its size, it will not be able to enter ports and will have to be moored off the coastlines of cities that it travels to. According to Sarasota, Florida engineer uh, who designed it, Norman, Norman Nixon, the Freedom Ship would circumnavigate the globe once every two years. So why is he building this thing? I mentioned before that 95% of the gains last year all went to the top 1%, right? This is the wealthy saying, we don't need America anymore. We've made our money. We've got all of our resources. Uh, and we're just going to go ahead and we're going to take it and we're going to go live someplace away from you, the rabble. When Nixon first proposed the project in 1999, many accused him of attempting to create a mobile tax shelter for the wealthy. That's the other thing. If they're going to live on the ocean, they're not going to have to pay taxes. He says, we're not trying to create an independent country. We're not building a tax haven at the same time. The real reason we're building the freedom ship is to have fun, make some money, and see the world. Condominiums on the ship will be sold once the initial funding for its construction has been secured. One-bedroom units will start at 150000 with luxury units selling somewhere between 7 and $10 million. Let's stick with the wealthy. So, um, 
there were a lot of protests for Black Friday, uh, mostly at Walmarts around the, around the country for what a lot of folks see as unfair labor practices by Walmart. Okay. Uh, there were, and, you know, the, there were tons of people that turned out for the protest. And of course, there was a story that said that unions were paying $50 to anybody who showed up for this. Okay. The, the LA Times is the latest major publication to report that unions are literally paying people, anyone, to show up at their demonstrations for Black Friday. This was in an email that was sent, uh, from a from a Walmart spokesperson. Quote, the NLRB said the practice of giving $50 gift cards to anyone who shows up to a protest is legal. Let's remember, when union-backed demonstrators brag about their numbers, they're paid to be there. And of course, that's not what happened. According to the NLRB memo, before last year's Black Friday walkout, the union advertised a $50 gift card for the first 700 employees who walked off the job on Black Friday. The NLRB noted uh, a campaign email which said, Going on strike is never an easy, easy decision. We're all barely getting by as it is. The first 700 associates who sign up to strike will get a $50 gift card from us to buy groceries for their families. The Black Friday protests were a success, and they were a wild success, and they got a lot of attention, but they also got some people fired. So this is what's important. about This is why I, I think more than anybody, for the largest private employer in the United States, who is Walmart, um, they need a union more than anybody because after protesting, some of them were fired. So during a phone interview this month, Josh Eidelman asked Brooke Buchanan, a Walmart senior director for corporate communications, to what extent does the National Labor Relations Act restrict punishing employees for not coming to work that day? Here's the thing. Uh, and he says, quote, Josh, you know we have a strict – Josh, we have a strict retaliation program here. This is a quote. Walmart takes it extremely seriously and we enforce that. And if any associates have questions or concerns, you know, we recommend that they reach out to their leadership and their management to discuss any of those issues or concerns. But we have a strict policy against the any kind of retaliation. But we also have an attendance policy. Uh, 55 people were arrested during the Black Friday Walmart protest, according to organizers. This comes to us from Salon. Those arrests, which came amid a, st a statement of support from a handful of congressional Democrats and plans for 1,500 total protests, took place at, at civil disobedience actions in Ontario, California, Arlington, Virginia, Chicago, Dallas, Secaucus, thank you, uh, uh, New Jersey. And Alan Grayson... Firebrand Congressman Alan Grayson hailed Black Friday civil disobedience in an afternoon interview saying that the Walmart workers uh, and supporters show the dissatisfaction of the middle class since the 2008 financial crash coming – it's coming to a slow boil now. If one person falls out of the middle class, that's sad, Grayson told Salon, but if millions of people fall out of the middle class, that creates a backlash which is being seen all over the country and we will potentially create a new political movement of the disenfranchised. Walmart hears us loud and clear. We are friends of labor here at TFYCPO, and we are not fans of Walmart. Um, but somebody who works for Walmart just got is is, a, is about to get hired into the White House. Now I don't know if you remember the president mentioned right away during the 2008 campaign that he was not a fan of the way Walmart was treating their employee, employees. But on Monday, he nominated Sylvia Matthews Burrell, president of the Walmart Foundation, to be director of the White House uh, Office of Management and Budget. You, had, you heard that right. Obama hiring from the ranks of Walmart is the latest development in the company's remarkable transition from an enemy of Obama that left no uh left to one of its uh excuse me and and the left to one of the most reliable partners in the business community obama declared that he would no longer shop at the store during his first presidential campaign and michelle obama decided to leave the board of a major walmart supplier but things changed after obama became president Walmart became a founding member of Business Forward, the Obama-friendly group that teaches participating businesses how to put 
campaign spin on economic issues almost immediately following the 2008 election. Business Forward has become a reliable partner of the administration. The organizers' members receive extraordinary access to the White House in exchange for donations and support of the president's agenda. Business Forward has also emerged as a financial backer of the progressive movement. The administration has been publicly open about its improved relationship with Walmart. Michelle Obama went from hiding connections with Walmart to being one of its biggest cheerleaders. The Center for American Progress itself has received somewhere between 500000 and $1 million from Walmart, and they are now avoiding criticizing it. Not everyone in the Democratic Party is keen on giving Walmart a free pass, especially not the unions. Remember, President Obama, they are enemies. Of labor. I'm not entirely sure why he's doing this. Um, interestingly, a group called Wake Up Walmart planned almost identical protests against Walmart during the 2006 holiday season, and Obama called the group that year to say he was proud of the work that it was doing. Obama is staying silent on this particular issue. I want to get into marriage equality, and then I want to get into a few weird stories, and, and of course, well, we're going to get into a little bit of religion this week. Um, the Mormons are becoming split over same-sex marriage. Follow me. On November 4th, a critical mass of Mormons in the United States Senate, including Republicans Orrin Hatch of Utah and Dean Heller of Nevada, played a critical role in passing the historic ENDA Act which is uh, protecting gay and lesbian Americans in the workplace. Just days later, grassroots LDS church members in the heavily Mormon communities of Oahu's North Shore received instructions during their Sunday church meetings on how to help defeat, by letter writing or organizing bus caravan to the state capitol, the historic legislation to secure civil marriage rights for gay and lesbian Hawaiians. So what do Mormons believe about homosexuality? This comes to us from Salon. Make no mistake about it, more than any other branch of organized Christianity, Mormonism is theologically hardwired around the sanctity of home, uh, excuse me, <laughs> of heterosexual marriage. The Mormon concept of God is that, is that of a married heterosexual couple, a heavenly mother and a heavenly father. Heterosexual marriage solemnized in LDS temples is viewed as a religious right necessary to full salvation and the heterosexual family is understood as a reflection of the essential nature of godliness in God's creation as an eternal unit. Speaking to the Times, Senator Reid related that a lesbian niece helped him work his way through the issues. The complexity of Senator Reid's own position suggests that as it turns out, 20th century LDS bureaucratic branding efforts notwithstanding, Mormons are actually subject to the same kind of growth and conflict as other people of faith, even if they tend to manage those conflicts in culturally specific ways. Mother Joan Stephanie Mensimer uh, suggested that the fear of harming Mitt Romney's presidential run in 2012 kept the Mormon church on the sidelines. In Hawaii, 70,000 Mormons compromised 5% of the state's population. By the way, there's also a BYU in Hawaii. I did not know that. So this, as it is with a lot of religions right now, uh, and more recently we've heard about this in the Catholic religion with the new pope that is coming to place, there's a divide. And I used to belong to this church. I used to belong to the Mormon church. And I, I remember how anti-gay they were. It was one of the reasons why I left, by the way. Um, in the Mormon church, I was harassed for being gay. Hi, everybody. My name is Melvin. I am now a married father of three. But I was harassed because they suspected... By the way, I was a teenager when I was in the church. They suspected that I might be gay. And I was harassed pretty endlessly. So... It's it's good for me to hear those kinds of things because it gives me hope. Because right now the number one case that's being made against our gay brothers and sisters is that, well, it's an affront to God. And God doesn't like it. Well, yay. <laughs> Let's follow the invisible man. All right, everybody. Time to move to Hong Kong. Uh, download speeds in the U.S. suck. 
<laughs> According to a new report, uh, that's not a quote, by the way. Uh, network diagnosis company Ookla on Tuesday released its most recent country-by-country country internet service provider speed test results. According to Ookla's report, the U.S. ranks a mere 31st in the world when it comes to internet download speeds behind much of Europe and Southeast Asia. According to Ookla, the dismal ranking isn't new. Since September 2011, Ookla's monthly speed tests have always ranked the U.S. between 25th and 40th place when it comes to speed. It's long been conventional wisdom that the that the U.S. Internet service has problems. A multitude of factors have been blamed, including everything from the FCC not sufficiently encouraging competition to the country's large stretches of sparsely populated landscape. But with about one-third of Americans lacking broadband Internet, according to the Federal Communications Commission, the cost of broadband Internet prices are climbing. Here's the thing. Oh, by the way, you know who's the fastest? Hong Kong. Yeah, Hong Kong's the fastest. We, uh, for all the free market talk, we don't encourage, um, we don't encourage uh, competition in America. We really don't. Uh, Comcast, uh, who's one of the large internet service providers here in America, uh, is, is, is feverishly, uh, lobbying and trying to keep other people out of, out of the game. Okay? And they're not the only ones. But it doesn't, it, it's not, and this is also an infrastructure problem, okay? With faster internet, with more internet, more access to information, a more educated people, well, you could have social mobility. And once again, we can't have that. Uh, Schwarzenegger wants to run for president in 2016. My goodness, yeah. This is the guy that, that boinked his housekeeper, had a kid with her, and his wife didn't find out about it until 15 years later. So, no surprise, the guy's running as a Republican. But here's the thing. The United States Constitution forbids foreign-born citizens from running for president. But many have attempted to challenge the law, Include, uh, according to the New York Post, former governor of California and action movie star Arnold Schwarzenegger will attempt to challenge the law and run for president in 2016. The 66-year-old Schwarzenegger was born in Austria and became a United States citizen in 1983. Uh, and he, uh, he was elected in 2003 during a recall and won re-election in 2006, holding the office until 2011. Sources note that Schwarzenegger will file paperwork uh, in an attempt to challenge the Constitution so he could be on the ballot in 2016. Schwarzenegger appeared on The Tonight Show in 2010 and told host Jay Leno that if the law was changed, he would seriously consider a run for the nation's top office. In order to have the law changed, it would have to be approved by two-thirds in the House and Senate and ratified by 38 of the country's 50 states. It doesn't look real likely. And then what are the birthers going to do? What are the teabaggers going to do, right? Because they're screaming that Obama wasn't born in America. This was a strange one. Um, assuming the letter is real, okay, and it's written on official White House stationery and bears a handwriting that looks an awful lot like the president's, uh, the president w recently wrote a letter in response to a note he received from Thomas J. Ritter, a fifth grade teacher in Texas. Okay, uh, He had written to Obama to complain about Obamacare and the vitriolic tenor of American politics in general. Quote, I watched you make fun of teabaggers and your press secretary make fun of Miss, Miss Palin, which was especially uh, beneath the dignity of the White House, he wrote. Uh, Do the right thing, not the political thing. Suggest a bill that Americans can support. In response, Obama echoed Ritter's use of the word teabaggers, a derogatory term for members of the Tea Party, but pushed back against Ritter's complaint that the White House critics are targeted and ridiculed. He says, I received your letter and appreciate your concern about the toxic political environment right now, Obama began. I do have the right to challenge you, though, on the notion that any citizen that disagrees with me has been targeted and ridiculed or that I make fun of teabaggers. What's the big thing right now? Obama's being ridiculed for using the word teabaggers. And they say, oh, look, he hates a section of America because he's using the word teabaggers. Um, well, they are. And Thomas wrote it in the letter. And then Obama quoted it back to him when responding to his letter. And by the way, you got a response from the president. That's pretty cool no matter who the president is. Okay. But it's not a big deal. Okay, I've you know, quote. I've gone out of my way to li to listen to legitimate criticism. Obama continued, and defend strongly the right of everyone to speak their mind, including those who call me a socialist, or worse. Now you didn't think I was going to leave here without talking about religion, did you? 
Oh, my favorite guy in the whole world right now, the Pope. Uh, Jesus Christ is weeping in heaven over the Pope's criticism of capitalism. Tea Party activist Jonathan Mosley published a WorldNet Daily column Sunday that challenged the Pope's interpretation of the Bible. Mosley, a Virginia business and criminal defense attorney, supports his claim with a verse from the book of Luke in which Jesus declines to act as an arbitrator when someone asks him to compel a brother to divide the family inheritance. In just one verse, we see that God, this is a quote, we see that God rejects the left-wing Jesus Christ-supported socialism heresy, Mosley writes, when Jesus was asked to support the redistribution of wealth to tell one brother to share the family inheritance with another jesus refused here let me let me step in here really quickly um he says jesus was a carpenter so jesus was a small business person there is one place in the bible where it mentions jesus and carpenter in the same sentence and that sentence is somebody asking if he is a carpenter you know how many times they call him teacher over 40. How many times they call him rabbi? Uh, about 15 times. But you don't hear those things being, being, uh, you know, talked about in the context, in the context of Jesus. One truth shines out from the Bible. Jesus spoke to the individual, never to government or government policy. Mosley writes, Jesus was a capitalist, preaching personal responsibility, not a socialist. Jesus Christ is weeping in heaven hearing Christians espouse a socialist philosophy that has created suffering and poverty around the world. Easier for you to get through the eye of a needle, for a camel to get through the eye of a needle, than it is for a rich man to get into heaven. Clothe the naked, feed the hungry, help the poor. Nah. Now that's socialist Jesus. So they've decided who they want Jesus to be. Uh, Gun Owners of America executive uh, Larry Pratt recently warned unarmed Americans that he found firearms in the Bible and that that was proof that God was judging unarmed Americans and blessing the gun owners. In a video obtained by Right Wing Watch of Pratt speaking at the Oklahoma Second Amendment Association breakfast sponsored by the Tulsa 912 Project earlier this month, he argued that gun control laws were a way that we will know we are under God's judgment. He pointed to a story in the book of Samuel where only two men in Israel had a sword as a result of their sinfulness. Finally, in his mercy, quote, God enables them to win in a battle and rearm, Pratt explained, but that must have been one nasty battle to go into a battle with only two guys and one gun and everyone else empty-handed. So I would submit that we cannot go into the battle empty-handed. He qualifies it by saying, it's not an actual gun. Um, it was a sword, but the sword was the gun of their time. And Jesus is judging the unarmed. What these guys have done is they've taken their current philosophy on the world. You know, people are inherently evil. Okay, and so therefore we cannot have democracy. Um, it needs to be a small handful of people at the very top that control everything. Okay? And then of course there's the Second Amendment. You've created an entire country of scaredy cats. So what you have to say is, well, you, everyone needs a gun because it's a very, very scary world out there. They've created a, a Jesus. And that is the Jesus that they follow. And it has absolutely nothing with the, to do with the Jesus that's actually in the Bible. I'm fairly certain that quite a few of them don't even read or haven't even read the bible all right i want to get to my final thought this week usually my final story has something to do uh with my final thought but um this week it's quite a bit different and i really 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 uh feel the need to talk about this it's really important to me um so there were uh, the, the fa- so today's the fifth thursday the fifth and there were a ton of of, of uh, protests all over the United States at fast food places. Uh, the bill before Congress right now is to raise minimum wage, the minimum wage to 1010. It's not enough, but it's a start. Quite honestly, in my opinion, it should be at $15. Um, I've listened to the news 
uh, news uh, and talk shows. I've read blogs and all the rest. And here's what really disappoints me about our conversation on this. And I mentioned this earlier with, a, with another story I talked about today. So much of the conversation that we are having isn't what you or I think about this. It's not you or I taking these issues and then expressing ourselves to that end and then having those conversations. What we are going back and forth with are the pre-approved talking points. I heard this so much today. We can't afford or the businesses can't afford to raise the minimum wage because those businesses would have to close. If you're Profit margins are so, and I'm sure I've mentioned this before, but I'm going to do it again. If your profit margins are so razor thin, okay, that that you can't pay your employees a living wage, they shouldn't have to work for slave wages. So, well, there's there's not enough money. What are you going to do? You know, that's another lie. I know that these businesses are making billions, okay? Their CEOs are taking home millions, okay? And then, and of course their shareholders are doing incredibly well. But you what you, uh, McDonald's owner, um, Arby's owner, Taco Bell owner, you would not have any of that money if it wasn't for these people on the front line. We can't afford it. Well, here's the thing. Those folks, and there was a memo that was, that was released recently where, uh, McDonald's, McDonald's, McDonald's and Walmart were telling people how to sign up for, for welfare. Does they know that they don't pay their employees enough? So you say we can't afford it, but here's the thing. Those folks are going to public assistance. And so we're subsidizing those businesses. Funny. Uh, you've got enough money for yourself. You don't have enough money for your employees. And we're, we're subsidizing your greed. It doesn't make a lot of sense. On the front lines, of course, are the, the, the workers that, that sweep the parking lots and, and the dining rooms and talk to the customers and, and, and all the rest. And you wouldn't have any of your money without them. You can afford to pay them more and you just don't want to. And it's really, really easy for you because you do not have to face them. I've worked for a small business owner before and I was paid a living wage. And I believe that, well, he did it because he was a, he was a good guy. The business owner was a good guy. But then there's this other thing. Uh, let's say that he wanted to keep more of the money for himself. Well, He's the business owner who works alongside us and he has to see us every day. If he decides that he doesn't want to pay us a fair wage, he has to see us every day. What's happening with the owners of these fast food restaurants is they're absolutely insulated. They don't have to see those employees that they're not paying very much money to because if they had to face them and they had to tell them to their face why they're only worth $7 an hour – I don't think that it would be so easy to pay them. It's also, it, it also insulates them when they decide that they want those people to work on Thanksgiving or Christmas. Cause once again, they can just hand it down to the managers and say, tell them that they're going to work on Thanksgiving and Christmas and that's all there is to it. And then they get to go back to their mansions. They say, well, fast food employees, most of them are just kids anyway, teenagers and all the rest. Actually, the median age of those employees is 28 years old. And a lot of them have families. And a lot of them are having to make really tough choices right now. Food and medicine. Christmas or no Christmas. Things of that nature. You know, they can't afford to own a car. They can't afford to get the middle class dream. But by the way, you're doing just fine. It's a lie. And I'm not hearing really anybody say that. So much of the conversation that I heard from my fellow Americans today was the pre-approved talking points. Those things in defense of this incredibly greedy industry. Your fellow Americans deserve to live and live with dignity. Especially if they're putting in full time. They deserve health care. Sorry, but they do. A right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. They deserve a living wage so that they don't have to worry as much about the unexpected. These are your fellow Americans. And I think if 
any of us knew somebody that worked in that industry and struggled like that, perhaps our opinions would change. And I certainly hope they will. We here at TFYCPO support the workers that protested on Black Friday, even if you got fired. Support the fast food workers that protested yesterday and did so without pay when they're already making menial wages. The struggle for labor, we support you. And by the way, in Spokane, we too support the Deaconess workers. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for joining me for another fiery episode of The Fire That You Can't Put Out. Uh, I want to send a special thank you to uh, to Kevin uh, and to Angela, who, well, I don't know if they realize that we're coming up on a year of this show uh, being in existence. And I would really, really, really like to get one or both of them on for the one anniversary show. I know you're out there listening. <laughs> we are The Fire You Can't Put Out. Uh, and we will be here again next week. Uh, same issues and all the rest. Uh, I want to thank you again for your support. Good day.